Good afternoon and welcome to the 2011 Gabriel Silver Memorial Lecture. I'm John Coatsworth, Dean of the Columbia School of International and Public Affairs. Um, the Silver Lectureship on themes related to world peace and international affairs was established in 1949 by a gift from Leo Silver in honor of his father, Gabriel. The first Silver Lecture was given by the then Columbia University President, Dwight Eisenhower. The 2011 Gabriel Silver Lecture will be presented by Lawrence H. Summers, President of the Emeritus of Harvard University and currently the Charles W. Elliott University Professor there. I feel a bit embarrassed to be introducing someone who obviously needs no introduction at all, so I will be as brief as possible. I first met Larry Summers in May of 2001 at the annual dinner for the advisory board of Harvard's David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies. The dinner, which was also a kind of goodbye party for Neil Rudenstein, Larry's predecessor as president of Harvard, the dinner took place in a cavernous banquet hall at the Harvard Business School. The highlight of the evening, apart from various speeches, including a particularly gracious tribute by Larry to Neil and to David Rockefeller, the highlight of the evening was a performance of Latin American dancers, dances by members of the Harvard College dance team. Just to be sure that all would go well, I sent several staff members from the center to preview the dances, which they described to me as lively, <coughs> but tasteful. <laughs> Little did I know. In the preview, attended by the staff, the dancers had worn their usual practice attire. At the banquet, the male dancers dressed similarly, black pants and turtleneck sweaters. The women's costumes, however, amounted to string bikinis connected to gaudy scarves that tended to wave in the breeze created by their animated movements. <laughs> Reactions among the diners varied greatly by gender um, and country of origin. <laughs> with several members of the board from Central America standing on their chairs to get a better look, <laughs> and a number of women from New England looking disapprovingly, as they uh, uh, often can. Some weeks later, when I managed to get an appointment to see the newly installed president, Larry invited me to sit down and said, that was a very nice party you had for Neil the other evening, but I have to tell you, <clears throat> I thought the dancing was offensive, sexist, and exploited. Wow, I said to myself, I've been at Harvard for nearly a decade, and this is the first time anyone has actually managed to tell me exactly what he's thinking. <laughs> what a breath of fresh air. It was a great privilege to work with, uh, with Larry for the next five years, decriminalizing study abroad, opening Harvard centers in Latin America, rescuing scholars at risk from various authoritarian regimes around the world, among other projects. As you all know, Larry's extraordinary career brought him fame at a young age as one of the world's leading academic economists, then four intense periods of work in Washington where he served on the staff of the President's Council of Economic Advisors under President Carter, then returned as Chief Economist and Vice President of the World Bank, came back again as Deputy Secretary and then Secretary of the Treasury under President Clinton, and finally served as Director of the National Economic Council for President Obama for two years. I will not attempt to summarize his accomplishments in these posts. It would take the rest of our time today. I will remind you, nonetheless, that long before the current recession, Larry was warning of serious imbalances in the US and global economy. Then in the 18 months that culminated in the election of Barack Obama, Larry's speeches, newspaper columns, and articles lucidly outlined a coherent economic strategy for the incoming administration, <coughs> and that since stepping down earlier this year to return to Harvard, no one has done more to raise the level of debate on economic policy in this country and abroad than Larry Summers. The title of his lecture today is The U.S. and Global Growth Challenges. <coughs> Larry, a warm welcome to the Thank you uh, very much for that uh, very generous 
and uh, probably over-flattering introduction. I'm reminded of what Lyndon Johnson used to say when he was introduced uh, so generously. My parents would have appreciated it. My, father, my parents would have liked to have heard it. My father would have appreciated it. And my mother would have believed it. <laughs> <laughs> Although given my comments about the dancers, I think my mother would have especially appreciated uh, that uh, introduction. I um, regard with considerable um, amusement and a certain satisfaction my good friend John Cooksworth's role as dean of this school and as acting provost of your university. Because I can only report to you that as a faculty member and center director, John Coatsworth saw it as his holy mission to pursue the right objectives, more or less whatever the central administration of his university felt. <laughs> and if it is said that the tax system breathes through its loopholes, that uh, John Coatsworth believed that academic progress was best made by avoiding and evading the holy writs of administrators, which he did with very substantial success and to Harvard's uh, great uh, advantage. I did ask him upon uh, hearing, however, that he had become an associate provost, whether he knew what Franklin Roosevelt said when he appointed Joe Kennedy as the head of the SEC. Roosevelt said it takes a thief to catch a thief. <laughs> well, John Coatsworth is no thief, but he surely is a great entrepreneur, and I'm sure he does a great job and will do a great job of supporting all the other entrepreneurs uh, here. I am uh, glad to visit again uh, Columbia's School of uh, International Affairs, a school that I believe with its location in uh, New York, with the extraordinary faculty that are assembled at uh, Columbia, does an enormous amount to contribute uh, to the riches of uh, the international policy uh, debate. And while I do not always find myself in agreement with members of your faculty, I do find myself very consistently stimulated, and stimulation can include irritation, um, <laughs> by uh, the writings of uh, members of your faculty, and certainly one of the most thoughtful on the topics that we're going to discuss today is Padma Desai's uh, recent book on, uh, the finan on uh, the financial crisis. I would like to convince you of two basic propositions that should come out of an elementary economics uh, course and then apply them to a number of the policy problems that the world faces right now. First of the propositions, and they both reflect fallacies that it is very natural would exist in the human mind. The first is this. It is not true that what is good for one is necessarily good for all. If you think about it, it is entirely intuitive and natural to suppose that if I do the right thing and John does the right thing and everyone in this room does the right thing, then the right thing for any one of us will also be the right thing for all of us. It's not true. If any one person in this room stands up, I promise they will see much better. If everyone stands up, no one will see better, and everyone will be less comfortable. If any 
one person sets out to save more, they will succeed in saving more and paying down their debts. If everyone in an economy sets out to save more and pay down their debts, everyone cannot pay down their debts simultaneously, and the result will be a reduction in the income of all, all actors. If any one bank seeks to retrench and shrink its balance sheet, it will find itself better capitalized. If all banks seek simultaneously to retrench and improve their balance sheets, they will all find themselves capitalized less well because the value of the assets they hold will diminish. Indeed, one of the main functions that should come from a good course in economics is the repeated demonstration of what might be called the fallacy of aggregation. That if you simply take the effects of a set of individual actions and add them up, that will be a good predictor of what will happen to the total system. This kind of thing is true, by the way, in many fields. People just don't recognize it uh, in economics. Psychologists have demonstrated that if you take people who have not thought about phenomena in physics, and you ask them what happens if you swing a, uh, you take a piece of string, you attach a ball to a rope, and you keep swinging it, and then you let go, and you ask them to predict what will happen, People who have not been trained in physics will answer that question by saying that the ball will continue to travel in a circle. So if you ask people what will happen if you drop something that is heavier and something that is lighter, they will answer that the heavier object will fall faster. If you ask people whether an object, what will happen to an object in motion, Newton said that an object in motion will tend to stay in motion. But almost nobody who's not taken a physics course will give that answer. They think an object in motion will tend to stop. And so it is real, there is basic reasons to think that human intuition goes wrong. And one crucial area where it goes wrong in economics is the fallacy of aggregation. The second area where I would suggest it goes systematically wrong is that we are all hardwired from birth, I suspect it is a matter of evolution, to learn what is a very basic principle of behavior that in the vast majority of contexts serves us very well. And that is, if you do something that yesterday that was painful, don't do it again today that when a mistake has been made, do the opposite of it going forward. And indeed, how else would you want people to respond to the experience of touch a hot stove or the experience of having stepped off a uh, ledge or the experience of having eaten something that was highly unpleasant. And yet, I would suggest to you, and I'll document this uh, going forward, that if you remember only one thing I said uh, from this lecture, remember this. It is the central irony of financial crisis that while it is caused by too much confidence, too much borrowing and lending, and too much spending, it can only be resolved with more confidence, more borrowing and lending, and more spending. And 
Now, I would suggest to you that it is the failure to understand and act adequately on these two basic fallacies. The fallacy of aggregation and the fallacy of avoiding past error that is contributing very substantially to continued stagnation in the economies of the industrialized world. I say this at what I regard as a moment of singular danger. The economic system is not working well anywhere in the traditionally industrialized world. It is a remarkable comment, but I believe an accurate one, to suggest that with 9% unemployment, a growth forecast in the 2 to 3% range, major financial institutions carrying credit spreads that suggest an annual default probability in the 10% range. The United States is probably in the strongest position in the industrial world relative to the situation in Japan, which is now in the 22nd year of its lost decade, and in Europe, where the issue has shifted, and this is a profound and unfortunate move, from being an issue of too big to fail to the prospect of financial systems that are too large to save. Let me say a little bit about the American context first and then move to the European uh, context and conclude with a few words on the global context. The problem in the United States is at one level enormously complex, but at another level actually quite simple. There is too little demand. Businesses, you can see it in the level of the unemployment rate. You can see it in the record low level, near record low level of vacancies. You can see it in the number of houses, shopping centers, and office buildings that are empty. You can see it in the factories that are not working as many shifts as they normally do. You can uh, see it in uh, the answers to the way businessmen ask, respond to questions about why they are not hiring more uh, workers. There is not enough demand. Why is there not <coughs> enough demand? Again, enormously complex view in some ways, but if you step back far enough, not very difficult. There was the tremendous confidence, tremendous over-optimism, tremendous borrowing and lending that I referred to a few moments ago. Then, the optimism disappeared. When the optimism disappeared, what happened? There was too much of everything, too much capacity, too many, have, too many houses. The value of those assets fell sharply. The motivation to produce those assets became nearly non-existent, given that they were in excess supply, and given that the price for which they sell had fallen precipitously. So the demand for physical investment fell sharply on the one hand. And on the other hand, the debts remained, the wealth fell, 
And so what did any household want to do? What did Columbia University want to do? They wanted to normalize their financial condition. And how do you normalize your financial condition? By saving more, spending less, and paying down debt. All of a sudden, a sharp decline in the desire to invest, a sharp increase in the desire to save. In fact, uh, from peak to trough, it was a 13% of GDP, or nearly $1.8 trillion shift. Now, economics has an answer for how that should all be accommodated. What economics classic answer is that the interest rate should fall, and when the interest rate falls, more people will want to invest, assets will become more valuable, and fewer people will want to save. Only one problem, you can't really hurt yourself jumping out of the basement, and the interest rate can't fall below zero. And so the predicament in which we found ourselves was an interest rate unable to adjust, a massive propensity to save, a very limited propensity to uh, invest, and what was the adjustment mechanism? Less demand and lower incomes. What does that suggest as the broad policy path forward? Well, first, it suggests some things that aren't the broad policy path forward or are not important in terms of the broad uh, policy path forward. It would be good to raise the potential of the economy to produce goods and services, to enable workers to be motivated to work more, to enable factories to be more efficient. Those are attractive things. But if demand is short of supply, and demand is constraining levels of income and output, then expanding supply in the short run will not be especially beneficial in increasing output. Rather, the focus needs to be on increasing uh, demand. What follows? First, the continuing importance of fiscal stimulus to move the economy forward. If the private sector is unable or unwilling to increase uh, its, to borrow and increase its spending, there is no alternative but for a government to be prepared on a temporary basis to expand its borrowing and its expand its spending. That has taken place to some limited extent in the United States over the last two and a half years. Unfortunately, the trend is now in the opposite direction towards fiscal contraction. To be sure, government cannot indefinitely and permanently raise its level of spending in excess of its level of taxes. But the fact that the long-term interest rate in the United States is now below 2% suggests that there is more room to do that. And that room can only be augmented if long-term commitments with respect to fiscal responsibility are entered into. But I would suggest to you that the greatest threat to the, holders, to the interests of the holders of U.S. debt is not some orgy of profligacy on the part of the Congress, but it is instead a, shr a shrinkage into semi-permanent stagnation. Increased demand on the fiscal policy side. And by the way, the demand can also be highly constructive. I fly about once a month into Kennedy Airport. I am not as an American proud of what I see <laughs> when I fly into Kennedy Airport. At a time when the long-term interest rate is 2%, at a time when the construction unemployment rate is approaching 20%, can it fail to make sense to fix Kennedy Airport? And at a time when there are between 25,000 and 35,000 schools in the United States with, with paint chipping off their walls, 
surely it makes sense to expand infrastructure investment more broadly. First, fiscal policy expansion to increase demand in the short run to resist deflationary pressures, coupled with measures directed at prudence in the long run. Second, financial uh, policy. It is true that the base level of interest rates now is sufficiently close to zero that it cannot be brought down uh, further. However, there is meaningful room between longer term interest rates and zero and the availability of credit for certain purposes is surely limited. Perhaps the clearest example of the failure to understand what I earlier labeled the central irony of financial crisis comes with respect uh, to housing. Yes, it is true that in 2005, housing credit was too widely available. Yes, you can argue, although it is an argument, that in 2002, housing credit was too widely available. But I would suggest to you that there is no rational argument of any kind in support of a status quo where housing credit is now less available and available only on much less generous and more restrictive terms than any time in the last 20 years. There is room for debate about just what should be done with respect to foreclosures. It's easy to say we should prevent foreclosures by reducing mortgage debt. It's harder to recognize that for every foreclosure you prevent, there will likely be several people who are paying their mortgages just fine right now who will be happy to take, take advantage of foreclosure reduction with implications that will work <coughs> through the economy. But to suggest that at a time when government is operating the housing market, it should be operated on the most restrictive basis within a generation, at a time when housing is of record affordability, and at a time when large numbers of houses are sitting empty, is just foolish. What we need with respect to housing is not a jihad against the next bubble, but an attack against this bus. That means promoting confidence. It means encouraging borrowing and uh, lending. And it means supporting more spending on uh, housing. Fiscal policies, easier uh, credit uh, conditions, these operate to change uh, demand. Third, and here, I would part company with many who would tend to agree with me on uh, these first two points. I would join uh, with the advice that Keynes gave uh, Roosevelt. We have, a, we have had in the United States, I would suggest, these last few years, an unfortunate cleavage between one group that tends to identify itself as progressive, that believes in Keynesian policies to respond to recession, but is dismissive of concerns about business confidence and feels that uh, what's necessary is to use this moment to attack many sins, uh, many long-standing sins of uh, business and bring about an era of reform. And another group that sees itself as pragmatic and business oriented, that believe that Keynesian macroeconomic policies are likely to be ineffective and counterproductive, and place enormous emphasis on improving the spirits of businessmen. Keynes had the wisdom 
to advise Roosevelt in 1933 that reform must await recovery. And the wisdom to advise President Roosevelt of the importance of respecting the animal spirits of business. This is a moment when we must, of course, meet our basic responsibilities and continue to enforce our law. But it is a moment when creating the demand that can turn a vicious cycle of layoffs, lower incomes, less spending, less income into a virtuous uh, circle becomes uh, especially important. All of this will be more successful if undertaken in the context of a clear commitment to achieve the objective of adequate demand and an unambiguous signal that that will be the determined objective. Because if a sense can be created that incomes will rise in the future, that prices will not always be completely stagnant, that sense can itself be a self-fulfilling prophecy. People who expect higher incomes in the future will spend more. People who expect more rapid increases in prices will purchase today rather than tomorrow. And that will, in turn, create the higher incomes. But if we are going to get there, we need to move beyond the fallacies that permeate so much of our economic rhetoric. The idea that because Americans work themselves into excessive debt and imprudently borrowed, we have this crisis. And therefore, we must work ourselves out of debt one by one. That if we each do what would have been virtuous to have done yesterday, good things will happen to all of us. It is a simple morality tale, but like most simple morality tales, it is not one that is right. I would conclude just by saying that all that I have said about the United States applies to Europe as an aggregate at a time when Europe is facing recession. And that Europe's problems are greatly compounded by the complexities introduced by the attempt to manage a single currency. That there exists a well-known phenomenon in all aspects of human behavior that is illustrated by the following observation. If four people in this room got up and moved quickly out the door, most people would look around and be a little confused and be a little surprised and try to figure out what was up. If 25 people in this room all of a sudden got out and rushed out the door, there would be much less reflection and much more rushing. That is what is on the verge of happening in Europe uh, today. The debt of most countries and uh, at most times is supported by the knowledge that if you're not the first one there, at least you can probably get the same currency that the guy who was first there got. And therefore, you don't have to be the first one out of the door. And that imparts a certain stability. That is not true when countries do not have their own currencies. That is why the state banking systems in the United States essentially all failed and had to come under a federal rubric. And that is the process that is happening chaotically 
in Europe uh, right now. We have to hope that it happens rapidly uh, enough before uh, panic uh, takes, uh, takes over. European policymakers have an awesomely difficult balance to strike. On the one hand, there is the imperative that I have emphasized of restoring confidence. On the other hand, there is the imperative of bringing about necessary policy reforms in countries that have been too profligate for too long. The guarantees and assurance that would staunch panic would also staunch the will to reform. Absolute insistence on the will to reform could lead to panic. That's what has to be balanced. No one, much less a central banker, looks too graceful on a balance beam. And that is why the policy response so often seems so surprising. But it is that balance that we hope has to be struck. Now, none of this is the most inspiring stuff in uh, the world. Assuring adequate demand, working out appropriate lender of uh, last resort arrangements. But it is necessary for almost anything else to work right. Keynes, during the Bretton Woods Conference, gave a toast to the economists present. He said that economists were not the trustees of civilization. That responsibility was to fall to the great artists and the great thinkers. But economists were the trustees of the possibility of civilization. Because only if economies could be managed capably could the highest callings of man be a reasonable aspiration. That has rarely been more true than at this moment. Thank you very much. much. We have time for a few questions and, and, uh, and answers. And I think I'll call first on Arminio Fraga, who is, some of you may know, uh, a great friend of the school, a uh, member of the advisory board of the university's uh, soon-to-be-opened uh, Global Center in Rio de Janeiro, the former uh, head of the Central Bank of Brazil during a very difficult moment which he managed with unbelievable skill, uh, and at present, uh, an investment banker uh, who does better than almost anybody else. <laughs> How are you? Doing? Oh, there's, a, there's actually a microphone in the middle. Thank you, John. Larry, this is a uh, most enlightening uh, lecture, but at the same time, uh, a scary one. Um, it's just the way things are. And um, I have a, just a couple questions that uh, uh, I think have, have a little bit to do with this panic that we're seeing and it could get significantly worse and, and our inability uh, to deal with it. Um, first, uh, when you talk about outgrowing the debt, really that's what this is all about in the end. Uh, what if there's so much debt, uh, you know, in some places, maybe not everywhere? Uh, what what would you suggest is sort of the likely outcome, and what are the possibilities? And, and amongst the possibilities, I'm coming from Brazil. I can't help but um, think of inflation. You know, growing up professionally in Brazil, as I did we have seen some of these limit situations. It's kind of like you're talking about physics and all these strange functions that we're asked to calculate what the limit is in, in a calculus uh, class. Uh, we, we've done quite of those uh, in, the real, in, in, in the real world. 
And, and one, of, one of them points towards inflation. And the question I have um, and is, why have we had so much trouble inflating a bit uh, in, the, in these circumstances? Because I, 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 most, most economists' intuition of inflation is that it has, uh, deep, deep inside, it has a fiscal root. And we are yet to see it. Where are we failing? So those would be my two uh, questions. Thank you. Let me uh, first just tell a story about uh, Armenia. Uh, uh, Armenia and I had known each other for uh, many years, but uh, we had not been in close contact. I was, at the time, at a quite dark hour in Brazil's monetary history. Armenia was named as the central bank governor of of uh, Brazil, and um, he called me soon after he took office, within a matter of a few hours, maybe a day, um, because I was the person in the U.S. Treasury who was in charge of international affairs. And we spoke about a number of things, and within the first 20 minutes of our conversation, Armenio asked me about several NBER working papers written by various professors of economics on the East Coast of the United States proposing various kinds of inflation targeting regimes. I was familiar with about half of uh, what he asked. Uh, I called back a day later with views on everything that he asked. But anyone who thinks that this kind of statistical work, this kind of mathematical theoretical work is some kind of abstraction uh, that's got nothing to do with the real world, should really be given pause uh, by the fact that someone assigned really responsibility for his country's financial future at a moment of the utmost urgency was discussing uh, the implications of various ideas uh, in uh, the Calvo model and uh, the Phelps natural rate uh, hypothesis and uh, the like. Understanding this stuff makes more accurately rather than less accurately makes an extraordinary difference uh, in the world. Armenio, you asked um, two questions um, and I, I probably should have touched on, uh, touched on both of them. Look, in a, um, my brother is a psychiatrist. He tells me that when you have a patient with problems, it is very important to figure out whether the patient is depressed or whether the patient is bipolar. Because if you do the bipolar thing and the patient is depressed, it's really not gonna be good and vice versa, you have to decide what the case is first. Something like that is true with respect to financial problems. You have to make a basic judgment as to whether the problem is of liquidity or the problem is of solvency. Is the problem that really uh, John can pay back all his debts if He's just given time and he's lent money at a reasonable rate and given a chance to work through the situation. Or is the, pro or is the problem that for the rest of his life, John can only earn uh, $20,000 and he's $90,000 in debt, in which case giving him money to try to pay back his debts is throwing good money after bad. And you have to make that kind of judgment and you can't make it with certainty but you have to make the best judgment uh, that you can. Part of the problem, and I suspect this is what Armenio is getting at, is that there's been a reluctance to do that uh, in Europe. There's a famous line somewhere in the literature about the 13th chime of a clock that causes one to doubt all that has come before and all that follows. When serious policymakers proclaimed that Greece, proclaimed for two years that Greece was solvent, 
and proclaim that Greece's non-payment today as is a wholly voluntary arrangement with no attributes of a default, it is a little bit like the 13th chime of a clock. And so you do have to recognize this. I, I get lots of things wrong, but I remember the things I got right. And I remember saying to every v visiting European during, 2000 and, during uh, late 2009 and 2010, I said, the day is going to come when you are going to assert that Italy is perfectly financially solvent and is in good financial health and can fully manage its problems, you are going to need to assert that. And when you assert it, you are, you are going to be right. And the problem is that because you asserted the same thing about Greece, nobody is going to believe you. And your credibility is a precious asset. So the answer is um, distinguish between liquidity and solvency problems. The problems I spoke about were primarily liquidity problems, and I spoke about the right solution, in my view, to liquidity problems, but there certainly are solvency problems. I think the question about uh, how come you can't make inflation, there's a, kind of there's a kind of argument from continuity, which is surely if somebody came from, ca came from Mars and counterfeit $50 trillion bills, we could get a vast amount of inflation. Right now, we have no inflation. Therefore, there ought to be some intermediate amount of money creating, which will create a little bit of inflation and help the, si <laughs> help the situation. And I think that's a quite compelling, um, I think that is a quite compelling argument. I think the difficulty is that one's normal intuition is that printing money, that, you know, inflation's about money, and if you have more money, then you have more inflation. I think the problem is that when the interest rate is zero, money is really like, money and bonds are really the same thing. And so by printing money and withdrawing bonds, you don't really do anything. And printing money and not withdrawing bonds, you may really have to create a lot of money to make a meaningful difference uh, in uh, the nominal stock. I do think the lines of thought that suggest that um, it's your objective to resist deflation or create some sense of momentum, uh, and that reinforces the effect, do add force to what a central banker does. And when you say, yes, we're going to try to ease liquidity conditions, but this has nothing to do with creating, ri ri creating rising prices, you're in a sense self-neutralizing your policies to an important extent. We have time for one or two more questions. Thank you. Uh, uh, you talked about pro providing confidence in housing market uh, via easier credit. Um, uh, I think the recently announced HARP program, Housing Assistance Refinancing Program, just uh, uh, is uh, thinking of doing that uh, by asking Bank, banks and investors of subprime mortgages to reduce interest rates for underwater uh, homeowners uh, who are holding these mortgages. But it would seem that this is progressing very, very slowly. The banks and investors of these subprime mortgages do not want to do this. Uh, there are enormous uh, enormous amount of paperwork to be done and so on and so forth. So my question to you, uh, would you suggest uh, that the Federal Reserve uh, begin by uh, taking over, say, $500 billion worth of subprime mortgages 
and put a floor to the housing market. I, I, I don't think the Federal Reserve is positioned at all to engage mortgage by mortgage uh, in the set of measures that are involved in refinancing. I think the level of interest rates on mortgages you know, could be lower, but is remarkably low right now. And the issues primarily go to the availability of uh, the go, go to the availability of credit, and uh, there is a balance. Uh, you know, everyone here who's taken a statistics course knows about the distinction between type one error and type two error, and the problem, in, and that's the issue in, with respect to mortgages. It's easy to describe various kinds of refinancings or debt reductions that you'd like to see happen that aren't happening. The problem is that if you let those happen, you may see a large number of other things happen that you don't want uh, to that you don't want to see happen. I share your frustration at how slowly HARP has uh, the uh, HARP program has moved. In some ways, it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be shocking. Uh, if right now your bank has a 6% mortgage with you and you'd like it to be a 4% mortgage instead, they do not have a strong motivation to be in a hurry to reduce your mortgage from 6% to 4%. So there's an answer to that in regular capitalism. The answer to that in regular capitalism, well, is if they want to keep you, as a customer, they have no choice, otherwise you'll go somewhere else. The problem is that if you've got a $200,000 house and a $300,000 mortgage, no one else is going to take you. And therefore, you're a bit stuck with your existing bank, and your existing bank isn't that motivated to uh, reduce your rate. Now, the potential answers involve the fact that if the government's guaranteeing the credit risk on the mortgage, then the government's got, the, got it anyway, and the government ought to be made, the government's position will get better if you have only a $200,000 mortgage rather than a, three, a $300,000 uh, mortgage, which goes back to the behavior of Fannie and Freddie. Fannie and Freddie uh, are behaving as the classic pro-cyclical, close the barn door after the horses have uh, left, public policy actor. They lent excessively. They had insufficient credit standards. They were too focused on expansion. And now they are going to be damned if they are going to let somebody stick them with a bad mortgage. So suppose there's dishonesty or error or something. Right now, in the first mortgage, the 6% mortgage, Fannie and Freddie have the ability to go back to the original bank and stick it to them. No new bank is going to give a mortgage based on the first bank's warranty that everything is okay. And so even with the guarantee, the competitive mechanism is complicated. I just oversimplified uh, that problem, and there are two or three other problems like it that are, hold, that are holding this uh, back. I do think a generalized posture of being much more willing to lend on their part would be quite constructive right now. But we have a general problem in the financial area, which is there is a, which is that at moments like the present, old lending is turning out to be massively unprofitable, and there is a reluctance to face the fact that it was as unprofitable as it was, and new lending 
actually can be quite profitable, but in the face of the emerging discovery of more and more problems associated with old lending, it's difficult to get new lending going. That's sort of the pro-cyclicality problem I spoke about. Larry Summers, thank you so much for coming to see